We study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel. We've got extra copies if you didn't bring one and you'd like one to follow along. Just raise your hand up real high and someone will uh, drop one off at your row, your aisle. Uh, it's always good to look at the text and, and uh, be able to kind of drink it in uh, yourself a little bit. Now, um, we are calling this study The Incomparable Christ. It's a study of the book of Hebrews and indeed he launches... Uh, in that first chapter, those first four verses are so Christologically rich and dense um, and just uh, deserved an entire week, which we gave to them, and they deserve much more than that, actually, but a uh, really, really rich way to start pointing us to Jesus. Some call it a letter, but it doesn't start like a letter, so it doesn't say, I, Paul, writing to you, or I, Paul and Timothy, writing to you. There's no salutation on the front end. There's a, a epistolary ending. It's so uh, some people argue that, well, that just maybe the epistolary opening, just the salutation just got lost somewhere. And and, and maybe that's true, I don't know, but it could have been a sermon, a treatise, or an essay that was written and circulated, uh, as well as it could have been a letter. This writer appears to know the persons to whom he's writing, or, and, um, and there's much speculation, and if you're curious about all that sort of thing, you can uh, obviously do a bunch of study on your own or go back to our very first study online. I, 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 I laid out a, a few of the options that I have read. Now, um, when we come to this next passage, just these fir first four verses of chapter two, there's a, a real shift, okay? So uh, chapter one is all uh, indicatives. There are no imperatives. There's no exhortation, no warnings, no instructions for you to do this or you to do that. There's nothing wrong with God instructing us and telling us how he would like for uh, us to conduct ourselves. There's nothing wrong with his commands. His commands are good and, and right. Uh, but in chapter one, we have, uh, much like we do in some of the Paul's letters as well, we, we have these indicatives that are presented. And then there's usually some kind of a, a, a shift at some point where some imperatives are shown, like Ephesians, for instance, chapters one, two, and three, all, almost all indicatives, chapters four, five, and six, uh, lots of uh, overflowing with imperatives. So um, this is helpful, uh, especially when we're trying to figure out God's will and God's ways in a world that is uh, so broken and in and, and, and such despair and darkness and mired in a, in a lot of uh, sort of foolishness and recklessness and all that. And so many times uh, there are things that variables in our lives that are, that are happening that, uh, that indeed are uh, uh, difficult to bear. And much like with the folks here uh, that seem to be uh, um, going through some kind of persecution in the early church, uh, we might find ourselves as well struggling with some of the circumstances uh, that are going on either in our personal lives or in the na neighborhood we live in or at work or maybe, you know, in our culture, whatever. And sometimes we'll say something like when we believe a situation is not as simple as it appears, uh, especially as it appears to be at first glance or upon the surface look, uh, we might, we might uh, employ that old maxim that goes just like this. There's more to this than... Yeah, we might say that kind of thing. There's more to this than meets the eye. And I think the Bible actually would agree with that in a lot of cases and a lot of, a lot of subjects and a lot of categories. I'll throw up on the screen some of you, who ever, if you've ever taken a Philosophy 101 course, uh, you've, you've struggled with all of these kinds of questions or you've at least been confronted with them. Where did everything come from? Some people are wondering, where did everything go? But where did everything come from? What's the source origin of everything? Can I find meaning and purpose in life? I would... I would bet whether you're a believer or not, you would have found yourself asking that question at some point. What does it mean to be a human person? We're struggling with that great in a huge way right now in our culture. What does it mean to be a human person? Are we created beings? Or did we create ourselves somehow? Raise your hand if you think you created yourself. You should not be raising your hand right now. Um, uh, if you had anything to do with your coming into being, no, you can't raise your hand there either. Um, uh, but what does it mean to be a human person, a created being, that life is a gift uh, and, and not something that we can be just dismissive of? What does that mean? What does it mean to be a human person? Are there any absolute truths? Okay. Um, if you think the answer to that question is no, you just stated an absolute truth, that there are absolutely no absolute truth. So that doesn't work either. That sort of turns in on itself and eats itself like a serpent chewing on its own tail. 
Um, are there any absolute truths? How can we tell the difference between right and wrong? And in a society of more than one, this becomes increasingly more important. If it were just you, you might be able to say, well, I think what's right is this, and I think what's wrong is this. But guess what? You won't even live up to your own definitions of that. Why? Because we're all hypocrites. Some people don't go to church because they think the church is filled with hypocrites, and yes, it is. But so is the entire world. Every church person is a hypocrite. Every, every Christian is a hypocrite. Every Jew is a hypocrite. Every Muslim, every Buddhist, every Hindu, every atheist. We all say one thing and do another. None of us live up to our own standards. Uh, hypocrisy is the most provable doctrine of the Christian faith. <laughs> so if you were looking for a group of hypocrites to be a part of, welcome to the village chapel. We don't rejoice in our inconsistency at all. We come here because of it. It, We're motivated to come here so that we might hear the good news that A, we're forgiven, and that B, God can do something about this and intends to. So, all right, I digress. What is our destiny? Do we even have one? Is this life all there is? Um, And this connects really well to is there any meaning uh, and purpose in life? If there's no meaning or purpose in life, if there is no destiny, and then we just close our eyes, and it's just blackness and and no awareness whatsoever for for the rest of eternity, then that means this life right here is all there is. You better get all you can while you can. You see how these these questions, your answers to these questions really matter. They really matter if you're standing next to a grave. They really matter if you're facing end-of-life issues. They really do. So you're really more to this than meets the eye. Assuming God's existence, as we do around here, we believe in the existence of God, but we also believe that the existence of God matters, that it affects our answers to those questions. And we study his word, we begin to find meaningful, reasonable answers to some of those gigantic questions that people have asked for for so long and that are on so many people's hearts and minds. We might ask, in addition, are God's directives and opinions on a subject ultimate? Or are God's directives and opinions on a subject merely among the many options that we have to choose from? What is God's role in the universe and the affairs of humankind? Is there really, as a creator God, is there really some warranted claim that God has on your life or on my life and the way I conduct my relationships, the way I do my work? The way I enjoy or define or, or beauty or truth is, does it matter that I believe in God when I come to answer the question, what is true, good, and beautiful in this world in which we live? Some of you might want to go to the back and get another cup of coffee. Um, some of you, although you've already had enough and, and some of these questions bother you a little bit, you came here to just be sort of... Uh, uh, encouraged and, and, and sort of hope for a feel-good message. And, and I think ultimately this book is actually going to lead us to life because it's going to lead us to the Savior, and that's good. So I, I think ultimately we, we want that ultimate same thing. But I think that we go through some of these questions for a really good reason. God has put that curiosity inside of you and inside of me to draw us to himself. And to Jesus. All right, so Hebrews chapter 2, first four four verses after all of that on ramp. For this reason, or some of your translations will say, therefore, whenever there's a therefore in the Bible, we ask the question, what is it? Yeah, exactly. What is it therefore? For this reason, what reason? For chapter 1 as a reason, for all that's stated in chapter 1. For that reason, we must pay much closer attention. What kind of closer? Much closer. The most, the closest attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. This is interesting. So different from all of chapter 1, filled with these indicatives about the person and work of Jesus Christ. How majestic, how powerful, how beautiful, how glorious, how divine the Son of God. And here there pivots right into this. 
We must pay closer attention. Why? Because of how beautiful he is. Because of how true he is. Because of how wonderful he is. And uh, what a great savior he is. Lest we drift away from that message and from him. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense. And the word spoken through angels here is certainly their reference to many of them um, uh, from several passages from some of what Paul says. Believe that angels attended with God the Father as he gave the law to Moses at Mount Sinai. So Jews of the first century would have indeed thought that the, the, the angels were involved in at least conveying the word of God's law. And if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, that is, God's word is true, God's laws are, his, his statutes, his principles for life are true. Every transgression and disobedience of them received a just recompense. Where was that? Well, in part, before the time of Christ, for 40 years wandering through the wilderness, they suffered some because of their own rebellion. But now that Christ has come, in chapter 1, we were told this glorious news that he made purification for our sins. Somebody say amen. amen. He has made purification for my sins and your sins. Yes! That means I don't have to do that. I'm not going to face the wrath of God for my sins. I am a sinner. This I know for sure and with great certainty. But when I face God, I'm going to point to Christ because Christ is the one who has made purification for my sins this is wonderful how if we ignore all of this uh, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation after it was at the first spoken through the Lord it was confirmed to us by those who heard so the Lord Jesus speaking the apostles or disciples confirming it those who heard Jesus say that, God also bearing witness with them both by signs and wonders, by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Verse 4 is so chock full of the way God so uh, with such great energy and creativity revealed himself through the person and work of Jesus, through the signs, the wonders, and the miracles. Each of those words can overlap, I think, in terms of their meaning. That's true. Signs don't point to themselves. They point to something else. They point to him. John, in John's gospel, uses that word signs over and over again as he describes the miracles of Jesus. They are signs. They aren't meant to point to themselves. They're meant to point to Jesus. They're wonders as well, though, reminding us that our faith is also the kind of thing that we can understand and be overwhelmed and thrilled with wonder, filled with wonder because of what God has done. And they're miracles because the only possible explanation for some of those signs and wonders and miraculous acts, the only possible explanation for them is God. Because nobody else could have done that. And those things all point to and find their fulfillment in Christ and the gifts of the Holy Spirit as well. Here we have a second, a second generation of Christians who knew some of the apostles. And he's writing to them, even though they're getting, under, undergoing a bunch of persecution, a bunch of difficulty, the world around them is darker than our world even has begun to be. Uh, some of them will face um, lions in a stadium. Some of them will face a spear, a sword, uh, an arrow because of their faith, simply because of their faith. There are parts of our world right now where that is actually true. There's some of that going on. We're kind of impervious to it over here in the West, but there are places where that happens. We get ridiculed a little, but never this kind of uh, persecution that these folks are suffering with. All right, so there we are. Uh, verses 1 through 4, the first warning, admonition, exhortation uh, in the book of Hebrews. Um, it at least uh, got my mind thinking, how do we handle that kind of stuff in our world, in our day, in our time? How do we handle warnings? 
I mean, you've all seen the, you know, like the, 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 pro, the warnings on pro, you know, product labels that, that uh, and maybe you've seen some of them online, but some of them make you scratch your head. Um, I wrote down a few of them on a salt packet. The warning was, contains salt. Awesome. Thanks for the warning. Heads up on that. Yeah. On a travel pillow, there's one that says, do not use while sleeping. What good is that? There's a dishwasher and the warning on it says, do not allow children to play in the dishwasher. You really have to tell them that? And all the parents said, yes. Um, there's a child-sized Superman costume. The warning says, wearing this garment does not enable you to fly. There's a dog medicine that has a warning label on it. It says, alcohol may intensify the effects. I can see a married couple coming out. Honey, what's gotten into Ranger? <laughs> Why is he up howling at the moon on the, while he's dancing on the table? I'm just not sure. Um, there's a disposable razor that has a warning on it. Do not use during an earthquake. Okay. So is the first thing on your mind when the stuff's falling off the shelves and the house is rattling, oh, I can't go outside, I've got to shave. I mean, something's wrong with you if you need that warning. On a can of tuna, it says, caution, contains fish. I call that good news. I, that's not a warning. On a Rowenta iron, do not iron clothes while on body. Really? on a string of Christmas lights for indoor or outdoor use only. <laughs> so now we know that Griswold was actually playing by the rules when he did that, right? In a culture that worships the self, you know, at the altar of self, because it's really, in our culture, you're the one who decides what's right and what's wrong. The answer to those big philosophical questions is all in you. You determine what's right and what's wrong, how you're going to conduct yourself in your relationships with others, now, the way you're going to conduct yourself in your business, the way you're going to conduct yourself uh, as a son with your parents. It may be difficult, or as a daughter, you know, or maybe as somebody with in-laws that are difficult, whatever that might be. What, who is it? that decides for you? What's the answer to this question in a culture that worships the self? Is the self the only authority we can acknowledge? How do you think that approach is going to work out for us in a society of more than one? Um, because we are prone to recklessness. We are prone to selfishness. We are prone to disregard of others. That's what happens when I just let myself be me. And uh, what's probably needed, you, know, you watch our culture also worshiping at the altar of what they might call authenticity. I ha there's this you know, sort of idea, I've got to be me, true to myself and all that sort of thing. And I got news for I look in the mirror and I look at myself and I see my, the way I think and the things that I wrestle and struggle with. I go, I need a little less authenticity in my life. And maybe you can think of somebody you know that needs a little less authentic themselves showing up. Maybe a little more self-control would be helpful. Maybe a little more wisdom would be helpful. Maybe a little more transformation would be helpful. Where do you go to find that in a world that denies the existence of God or the existence of truth? And here we find in Hebrews reminding us to look to Jesus, to sit up straight, to pay attention, to more carefully, and remember, he's writing not to unbelievers, he's writing to people who have heard the gospel, and most of whom who believe the gospel, there will be some he will talk about later, who, had, who put the jersey on but really weren't on the team, but they heard the gospel, and they tasted of it, they sampled it, but they don't really believe it at some point. You just have to find yourself wondering where was the disconnect? And he's even addressing that right here. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention. Closer than what? Closer than five minutes ago. You know? Closer than last year. You know, is your spiritual life like mine? Mine on a graph would look like this. <laughs> Yeah, 
<laughs> you know, it's just kind of undulation all the time. Because I'm not paying attention all the time. I'm drifting. And uh, I need this word of encouragement. So three things I'm going to lift from this. First of all, beware the dangers of a drifting life. In your life with God, are you drawing closer or drifting away? Good question that the author of Hebrews wants us to struggle with, wrestle with, ask ourselves, can be confronted by. Are you drawing closer or are you drifting further away? Proximity is important. Where are you at? In your relationship with God. Hebrews seeks to awaken us. We must pay much closer attention and beware the drifting life. The word translated pay attention um, is, is in, in Greek was a, was a nautical term. And it's about navigating a tight space, getting the ship to pass through either a, some narrow strait or to be able to get into a harbor in the, in the, at the right speed at the right place. Okay. And it's interesting because there's another, another uh, nautical term here, which is drift. <laughs> you know? The word for drift here is the same word they would have used to describe a boat that maybe had been tethered to a dock and somehow or another the tether had slipped and the boat had just drifted on out into the lake or into the river or into the, the sea. It's the same word they would have used for the ring that slips off your finger without you even noticing it's so subtle it happened and you know this week it actually happened to me with that very ring and I thought oh that's what that word means and I almost lost this because it just would have drifted off my finger some of you have lost rings like that and you know that in a very visceral way drift is dangerous. Many of us have experienced spiritual drift from time to time. We usually are unaware of the slow erosion, the declension of our faith until all of a sudden something awakens us or some difficult consequence follows and, and from our drifting or wandering away from the path of faith. That has happened to a lot of us. I usually, and most of you who come here on a regular basis, know that I like to throw quotes up here, mostly by old dead guys, but a couple by some living guys, um, and living people. And, 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 you know, so it's, it's not unusual for me to put a, a C.S. Lewis or a, a Tim Keller or a John Stott quote up here. But today it's Lloyd the Legalist on uh, Twitter. He says, nothing good ever happens on National Geographic after the phrase, sometimes the calf wanders away from its herd. <laughs> and it's all alone. And the lions are coming. And the tigers and bears. Oh my. Yeah. Some of you are awake. Um, <laughs> yeah, nothing good comes from that kind of drift. That's why it's so important for me, at least, I just speak for myself, to be a part of this herd. I need to be reminded what God is doing. I leaned over to Kim halfway through the service when you guys were singing. And I said, There's something going on here this morning. The Lord. And, and I, don't, I, I don't know what He's doing. I'm often up here just going, pray. He's doing something, you know. Please, Lord, come be among us. Move among us. But sometimes you do get a sense that there's something sort of special going on. and He's doing something interesting. Hebrews is a call to spiritual vigilance, alertness, and watchfulness. I think the Lord's moving all the time. But I think sometimes we're distracted away from it, and we're just kind of looking the other way. And so we don't see... We don't observe what he's doing, and we miss the glory, not only of his presence, but the glory of his providence. We miss that because we're not watching. We're not paying attention. Hebrews is a warning to avoid spiritual drift and become untethered, disconnected, aimless, to avoid the false sense of spirituality that is without substance, form, direction, and purpose. Man, if your spirituality is without form, without direction, without any sense of purpose, doesn't answer any of those questions I put up on the screen earlier at all, speaks to them, doesn't speak to them at all. I don't know what kind of spirituality you're looking for, but I wouldn't be satisfied with that kind. I'd want to, like the book of Hebrews, awaken you, stir you up, remind you, pay closer attention to what this book says about this person, Jesus Christ who has come and been in the middle of all that God is about. G.K. Chesterton in his book, Orthodoxy, which I highly recommend, it, was, it is always simple to fall. There are an infinity of angles at which one falls. 
Only one at which one stands. Wow. That's pithy, straight ahead, simple. And you know it makes sense, don't you? Yeah. You know? But at what angle are we standing? Keeping our eyes on him or not? Um, that same kind of truth, I think, was true uh, now. It was true in the time of Chesterton, before he died. It's true in the time of the Hebrews. Um, in more modern times, um, I think it was true uh, in 1973. There's a man here in town that wrote a song. Some of you know this song. And it expressed these kinds of feelings. It became a worldwide hit. It was recorded by all kinds of different artists from a lot, a lot of different genres of music. It, it, so disparate that you kind of go, wow, that just shows the power of a song. To actually have all those different artists record this song. It goes like this. Day after day, I'm more confused. Yet I look for the light in the pouring rain. If you know, say it with me. You know that's a game that I hate to lose. I'm feeling the strain. Ain't it a shame? Give me the beat, boys, and free my soul. I want to get lost in you and drift away. Oh, give me the beat, boys, and free my soul. Now, you're saying to yourself, I thought we're supposed to avoid drift. And yeah, we are. But here's what I like about that song. It uncovers, it unmasks the fact that this happens to us. This song can be useful to us in that regard. He says, day after day I'm more confused. Man, if that doesn't describe a whole lot of people in our world right now, I don't know what else would. I'm looking for the light in the pouring rain. Is there any... People wonder, where, there's no, when is it going to break through? You know? you know, that's a game I hate to lose. I'm feeling the strain and the shame. Give me the beat, boys. Free my soul. I want to get lost in your rock and roll and drift away. I'm looking for some solution, some out of this. And I, Dobie Gray is the one that made, made the song popular, but it's been done. R Rolling Stones. I mean, tons of different people have done this. Country artists have done this song. And, and I think it's touching on a timeless theme, and that's why I think it was, it was uh, uh, such a big hit. Mentor Williams was the name. He's the brother of Paul Williams, a lot, uh, probably more famous songwriter. But I think Mentor, who passed away in 2016, said, as he said in the interviews about the song, that, that it resonated with so many people because it, it, he had become deeply honest about his vulnerabilities. How about us? I mean, Hebrews 2 is calling us to beware of the drifting life, the aimlessly drifting life. Is the only solution for me to find a, a, a three-minute anesthetic that I can just escape? Or is there some more lasting, more hopeful conviction about something or someone or some news that's been declared that might actually really make a difference in a long-lasting kind of way. Is there some good news out there in this world of dark and darkness and despair? I think there's more to this than meets the eye. Do you? I think most of you do. What is it that's so timelessly true about the human condition that we May, um, we have this chronic longing, no matter whether we're from ancient times or modern times, no matter whether we're wealthy or poor, young or old, married or single, religious or irreligious. I mean, our recovery clinics are full of people that have accomplished much, acquired much, achieved much. And you would think that as much as we all spend our time trying to do all of that, that if we ever achieved and acquired and accomplished much, we might be happy. We might find life flourishing, but that's not the case. We're looking for something more than this world has to offer. And it is on, what we're looking for is on offer through the gospel. Hebrews calls us to spiritual vigilance, like I said, alertness, watchfulness, to avoid spiritual drift, just aimlessly drifting away, disconnected. 
a, a, a spirituality without form, direction, or purpose. Secondly, Hebrews 2, 1 to 4 is calling us not to neglect, but rather to remind ourselves over and over and over again of our great need for God's redeeming grace. Don't neglect what you have heard, he says. So they've heard something. They've heard some kind of a message. Most of them, it seems, have come to believe that, but some of them were drifting back into religious rule following, and he warns them against that later, and we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that as we get through Hebrews. But he says, don't neglect your need of grace and God's rich offer of grace through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Don't neglect to remind yourself over and over again. That's why I need to preach the gospel to myself over and over and over again. There's an old Scottish preacher who said, for most of us, the threat of life is not so much that we should plunge into disaster, but that we should drift into sin. There are few people who deliberately and in a moment turn their backs on God there are many who day by day drift farther and farther away from him. We must be continually on the alert against the peril of the drifting life. William Barclay. Um, there's a more modern writer in a book I really, really have uh, enjoyed this year called Watchfulness. Brian Hedges is his name. He says, you are absolutely helpless. The enemy will attack. Temptation will come. But left to yourself, you'll be like a tumbleweed in a tornado. A handkerchief in a hurricane. The lion will roar. The viper will strike. The flaming arrows of temptation will fly. And you will fall apart from grace. And that's why you need God. I love that kind of honesty. Yeah, I love the honesty of drift away. The song drift away. I love that honesty. I love the honesty of still haven't found what I'm looking for. I love the honesty. And sometimes our poets and our songwriters say it the best and most honestly and the most creatively. We need to be awakened. We need to be cautioned, warned, alerted, if you will, to the dangers of a drifting life. But we need to be reminded over and over again that we are not apart from grace. You don't have to be a tumbleweed in a tornado. You don't have to be a handkerchief in a hurricane. Yeah, there are lions. Yeah, there's vipers. And see, this is the Christian faith. It does not deny the reality of lions and vipers. It doesn't deny the, the reality of tornadoes and hurricanes. It just says you don't have to be a tumbleweed in a tornado. You don't have to be a hanky in a hurricane. Because the offer of grace is there. This God who chose to come himself, he had sent angels, he had sent prophets, he had sent miracles that happened, all this. Right. Finally, he comes himself in the ultimate and final word of God's grace. That's why the third thing is so important. Pay much closer attention to the Jesus of chapter 1. All right? So beware the dangers of the drifting life. Don't neglect to remind yourself over and over again of your great need for God's redeeming grace. But please, above all, look to Christ and keep looking at him. Keep looking at his beauty, his glory. Okay, Because what happens to some of us is we say we believe grace, we say we believe the gospel, but we functionally live like legalists. And we functionally think, oh man, I blew it again. He Surely he doesn't love me. Surely he isn't going to forgive me. We're so programmed by performance mode in this world that we live in that it's almost, almost impossible for us to believe in grace. God's grace. I love that. Grace, grace, God's grace. It's so beautiful. And it means every single time I fall, and it's going to happen again, sooner than I want it to, His amazing, astonishing, mind-blowing, eye-popping grace will be on offer to me to restore me, to draw me back to Himself. To hold me fast when I can't hold him fast. Isn't that beautiful? Somebody say amen. Yeah, I think you got it. Here's the Jesus of chapter 1. He's at the center of everything God's doing in revelation, creation, and redemption. We learned that in those first four verses of chapter 1. He's the center of God speaking. He's God, Christ himself. He isn't only 
sort of replaying something that was told to him. His word, he is the living word. John 1 tells us, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And verse 14 reminds us, this is Jesus himself, the very living word of God. He's at the center of everything God's doing in creation. So that means that, yes, you are no... uh, When you look at the human person, the answer to the question, does human life have value? Yes, every human life has value, from the womb to the tomb. Why? Because created in the image of God. No matter what we believe, no matter how we've responded, there's still the image of God, even though it may be distorted and twisted in some ways. But every human life has value intrinsic value, not not because we're good southerners, not because it's part of our culture, but because God has imprinted his image in that human life. So every human life matters. See? So for us, this isn't a political issue. This is a spiritual issue. This is a biblical issue. Every human life has value because it was created in the image of God. Redemption is on offer to every single one of us. The gospel offer is universal. The call is repent and believe. Would you do that? Have you done that? The the offer is to anyone. doesn't matter what country you're from. doesn't matter what color you are. doesn't matter how, how much you've messed up, how far you've drifted away. The gospel offer stands. And it's for you. It's an offer. It's not a requirement. It's not some list of things for you to do. It's not a way for you to balance out the moral scales. No, it's an offer of a free gift of salvation um, by grace through faith in Christ. Would you turn to him and believe? Would you bow before him? Gregory of Nyssa, 4th century early church father, just as at sea those who are carried away from the direction of the harbor bring themselves back on course by a clear sign, so scripture may guide those adrift on the sea of life back into the harbor of the divine will. You see, we know through scripture that the gospel offer is for you and it is for me, sinners though we may have been. Foolish, reckless though we may have been. The gospel offers for me. How do I know that? Just Is it just a warm, fuzzy feeling, you know, in, in a sort of hallmark romantic world? No. The offer is right here in writing. It's in words. It's plenary, propositional language that I can understand. It's not just a feeling faith. It's a substantive faith. It's not just an anesthetic I drift away into for three minutes and makes me feel good. It's actually a conviction that something God has done for me, I couldn't do for myself, and he has made an offer to me. And that conviction is what I, is, is what I believe, and so I hope in him. My trust is in him. And scripture reminds me of that over and over again. Rankin Wilburn has a great book out called Union with Christ. Our neglect of union with Christ explains the gaps between our faith and our lives. When the work of Christ for us becomes abstracted from the person of Christ within us, is it any wonder there is a chasm between our heads and our hearts between our beliefs and our experiences? Is it surprising that we feel frustrated, cynical, or tossed to and fro? Is that you, frustrated, cynical, tossed to and fro? It's me from time to time. I'm standing up here being honest with you about that. Last name's Thomas. Struggle with doubts. You know, cynicism. Man, I can go there really quick. I'm like varsity cynic. I'm a pro, okay? Um... But all of that, see, that all, when I read the word, when I get on my knees before God, when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to me, he reveals to me that all of that's born out of my arrogance. And that what's on offer to me is not, is not merely a list of rules to follow, but a robe of righteousness that isn't my own, that comes from Christ who himself lived the sinless life and then took on himself my sin as he went to the cross and paid the price for me so that I could be forgiven. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention than we have been. 
to what we have heard about Jesus Christ. Ella Wheeler Wilcox, I'll close with this. One ship drives east, another drives west with the self-same winds that blow. It's the set of the sails and not the gales which tells us the way to go. Please, I, I beg you, set your sails for Jesus. Set your sails for the gospel. It is good news. It's great news uh, for people like me and for people like you who have come to the place where we understand, yeah, man, this world is dark. It's confusing sometimes. But there is hope. Why? Because the light has broken into the darkness in the person and work of Jesus in whom we can turn now and place our hope, our confidence, and our faith. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this passage, all the promise that it holds. Even in your uh, provocation, you're stirring us to awaken your uh, exhortation to us in these four verses. You are still at work to build hope into our hearts, to plant the seed of hope in our hearts, uh, to renew us and restore us uh, in your redeeming power. Turn our eyes upon Jesus, um, Lord, that we might see him in his truth and, and has his goodness and his beauty and receive from you this wonderful gift of salvation by grace through faith in Christ. In his name we pray, amen and amen.